Thank you very much, Jens. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really an honor for me to be back here again. Um, as Jens said, I had a wonderful time here, two years at Harborview with Jens, and lots of the work which I present here, we did together. And uh, well, this was really a privilege and lots of fun to do all of this work in this wonderful environment. Well, we started this morning at the uh, um, occipital cervical junction. Now we are down at the lumbopelvic junction, and uh, some of you might not work in this area quite often. But before I go into this, as Jens mentioned, um, where I come from is actually from Bochum. Now let me see. This works. It's marked there. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's not working. It doesn't matter. It's very weak now. Well, you see it where the red arrow is. Um, this is where I'm coming from, and as Jens said, this uh, setting there was actually quite unique because in 1890, um, the politician said that for the mining industry, we need a special trauma hospital. So it was built just for that. And uh, since that time, there are um, lots of other departments now beside general surgery, um, which are now 22 departments in this hospital and specialty clinics, but everything is um, in relationship to accidents to trauma surgery and to um, workmen, uh, thank you, workmanship diseases. My department now has um, 70 doctors working in the department. We do around five and a half thousand operations per year. Well, now let's talk about the lumbosacral junction, which is a challenging area because of the multi-directional forces which are applied there. However, um, Fixation techniques in this area often do not really apply to these special situations in this area. And I want to go through um, some of the cases with you, which you see here. Beside bony injuries, this, these injuries are often a soft tissue injury, which has to be taken care of. And you have all different um, variations of soft tissue injuries, from severe soft tissue rollover to severe contusion. And this is what you have to deal with first before you really go into the um, uh, surgery of the bone. Well, you can have severe, and Jens, you will recognize some of these cases because we did these together and, and during the time at Harborview. This was a severe uh, impairment injury in a young person. This was, is an elderly person with a crush injury to the uh, sacrum, which then develops and, and continues up to the lumbo um, pelvic junction. This was a gunshot injury with destruction of the posterior um, pelvis up to the uh, lumbo pelvic junction. This is a severe, in a young person, lumbo pelvic dissociation injury. And here you see, you hardly may, you may not see this injury here on that AP view, but this is as severe as these injuries. And um, so when we speak about spinal pelvic instability, we have situations like this one here with an acute trauma where your complete sacrum is more or less destroyed and where your um, connection between the spine and the pelvis is more or less no more existing. And there you have to deal with some osteosynthesis techniques. On the other hand, um, at least we in Germany have lots and lots of pelvic fractures uh, due to osteoporosis and insufficiency fractures. And this is a severe, continuous um, deformity which occurs over time in these patients and therefore often it's not realized by the physicians because they think, well, it's an elderly lady. She is, um, um, her urinary control was bad because of her, um, uh, in general, uh, gynecological problem and not related to maybe an ins insufficiency fracture. So these are situations we have to deal with, the insufficiency fractures. Then we have to deal with pathological fractures, like in this colleague, um, who actually had a more or less destroyed sacrum. And with that, then a vertical ileum fracture. This patient was also wheelchair-bound and regular fixation techniques in this area can hardly be applied. And then we have situations like this in paraplegic patients who then have 
and you see it here, an pseudarthrosis, instability, and um, there it's very hard to actually get a sufficient stable fixation at this lumbopelvic junction, especially in a paraplegic patient where you have these large forces applied at this area. Um, and then, of course, you have the secondary failures due to uh, former regular fixation techniques where you have to think of new stabilization. So these are all multidirectional instability problems at the lumbopelvic junction. Um, this is to show you how difficult it sometimes can be to realize what's going on. This is an AP of the pelvis. And if you look at the S1 vertebral body in this AP view, you look onto the vertebral body of S1 almost as if there is an inlet view. And this is only possible if there is a, a spinopelvic dissociation where actually the upper part of the sacrum is broken out of the sacrum and almost horizontally. So these two pictures are fitting together. So whenever you see an AP pelvis, look for the, um, for the form of the S1 vertebral body and be cautious then that there might be such a severe injury. Now let's talk about how to classify, how to speak about these injuries. Typically, um, pelvic fractures are um, classified uh, initially according to AO or OTA in ABC injuries. However, these classification systems do not really cover lumbopelvic instabilities. A, fractures are stable pelvic ring injuries, B, are in the horizontal plane unstable, and C, are in the vertical and horizontal plane unstable. But as you see in, these classification, in this classification, nothing deals really with the interconnection between the lower lumbar spine and the sacrum, and that's a problem. Also, if you look into the Dennis classification of sacrum fractures, we have trends uh, ala fractures, transferamal, and central fractures, but the, inter the connection between the lower lumbar spine and the sacrum is not taken care of. This only changed with the classification by Isler. Isler in the 90s described that transferaminal sacral fractures have a highly unstable posterior pelvic ring injuries and up to 40% involvement of the L5-S1 junction. And that changes the picture. This shows that we now do not just have to deal with the pelvic ring as such, but also with the lumbosacral junction. And this is typically not taken care of. Other classifications are more descriptive, like this one here, which shows in a bilateral sacral fracture with a transverse component, a so-called H uh, fracture, um, where the pelvic ring is disrupted. And the spine is more or less broken out of the pelvic ring. And then you have the other extreme where the pelvic ring as such is intact and uh, the spine is broken out of the upper part of the sacrum. This is a U-type fracture. So, and then you have the different versions in between. So this is more a descriptive uh, classification of these lumbopelvic instabilities. And then there is another one uh, originally built up by Roy Camille who uh, more from the mechanism of injury classified these injuries, which were mainly and most often in uh, uh, flexion mode. Um, but um, these were the type 1 and type 2. And then if there is an extension mode, so a, a motorbike driver uh, flying off his bike and then uh, um, falling onto the back, and you have a hyperextension injury. And this is what happens then where you're upper part of the sacrum is completely shifting anterior to the S2. And then you might have uh, clear um, and, and sole compression injuries to the upper part of the sacrum, or as you have seen in the initial one of the examples, a complete destruction of these injuries. Well, how do we fix these? The regular stabilization techniques are percutaneous or open SI screws, as you can see here, or plates or combinations. However, if you look at these, you realize that all of these fixation techniques are more or less in the horizontal plane, and they do not cover the L5-S1 junction. And therefore, 
in the highly unstable type C, so also vertical unstable um, injuries, we see in up to 26%, according to the literature, hardware failure. And that is the problem. And this was realized in the early 90s. And at that time, um, there was a change in principle. Um, four publications came out in 94. And at that time, we said, beside the horizontal fixation in this vertical and horizontal instability, we need an additional vertical fixation. And how can this be reached? By a lumbopelvic, additional lumbopelvic stabilization. And this creates a triangle here, more or less, the combination between L5 and ileum fixation in the kind of vertical direction and in the horizontal direction, the fixation with an SI screw. And this was called at that time triangular osteosynthesis. This fixation in young people was so stable that we actually could fully weight bear these patients from directly after surgery, which you normally could not do with an SI screw fixation. However, as the patients grew older, we had hardware loosening with initial full weight bearing in these patients. And, and that was related probably due to short screws. At that time, the only fixation systems we had were the regular pedicle screw systems, and they had a maximum length of around six centimeter screws. And they were holding just here in the posterior ileum. Um, so we saw windshield wiper effects in these fixations, especially in osteoporotic uh, situations, in tumors, osteomyelitis, and so on. And, and the situation which was not really covered was if there was an additional crush or a fracture to the posterior ileum. And at that time, uh, we started the work here together, Jens and I, and we uh, wanted to find out how to better get an anchorage, to get a better anchorage in the Ilium. And we looked at CT reconstructions and we more or less um, found out that there is an optimal canal for a good screw anchorage in the ileum between the PSIS and the AIIS. There is a bony canal which is known not only through our work but through the Galveston technique, Leto Nulls, acetabular fracture work, and so on. But what was new at that time and, uh, was that we found on a regular basis two um, cortical constrictions in the ileum. And if you have in this canal a long enough screw which actually passes these uh, constrictions, then we would have a very good anchorage of these screws here in the middle and anterior part of the ileum. So whatever pathology would be here in the posterior ileum and at the, um, at the posterior pelvis doesn't matter because these anchored screws are holding uh, in the ileum. The screws which you would need then can be up to 12 centimeters and have a thickness of up to 8 millimeters. The next question is, can you on a regular basis get these screws into the ileum? And of course, more and more people rely on these navigation systems, but not everybody has that available. Uh, we neither. So therefore, you know, we looked um, also together here at Harborview um, into typical um, C-arm views, which would guarantee us an optimal and very secure position of these screws. Um, so first view would be the lateral view where you identify the PSIS and the AIIS and of course the acetabulum and the sciatic notch. So your screw has to be above the sciatic notch, above the um, acetabulum and your starting point is the PSIS. And then if you look into an obturator um, outlet view, you will see directly into that canal and uh, the typical C-arm view will show you a teardrop, and that is where your screw is positioned. And vice versa, if you take the obturator inlet view, you will look on top of the canal, and with that view, you can realize whether your screw position is uh, perforating the outer or the inner table. So a regular C-arm is enough for these positionings. Next question was, is that fixation really more stable than the regular fixation techniques with SI screws or plates? And we did a biomechanical study here with a free-floating uh, free 
pelvis uh, on cyclic loading, and we compared this triangular fixation to regular ice, ice screw fixations. And you have also to know and realize that uh, all the biomechanical studies up to that point, which uh, compared one SI screw versus two versus plates and so on, did not show any significant difference in the stability. However, this additional lumbopelvic fixation showed a highly significant difference in stability. And why is that? Well, the forces from the trunk are um, going into that fixation system, bridging the pathology at this uh, lumbosacral junction and um, um, transferring the forces up to the anterior part of the ilium. Also, the flexing deformity, um, the flexing um, forces are counterbalanced by this posterior fixation technique. How do we apply it now in the pelvic fractures? Well, I don't want to go too much into pelvic fracture reduction techniques, but we have to make sure that the interpelvic ring is stable before we actually do manipulation posteriorly, and then we do the fixation. I have here the pictures where you actually see here the teardrop figure um, where the ilium screw is positioned, the L5 screws are positioned, and then you can manipulate your posterior pelvic ring on extensions, on joysticks, on these screws. And then you can add the longitudinal rod. And along the longitudinal rod, you're able to distract or compress and thereby reducing your posterior pelvic ring uh, nicely along that rod. And then you combine that with a horizontal fixation here with an SI screw. So far about the theory, I want to show you a couple of uh, examples and indications. The indications we see are highly unstable sacral fractures and lumbopelvic dissociations um, because regular fixation techniques may result in a too high um, loss of reduction number, as I showed before. We definitely think it is indicated if the L5 is one junction is involved in these fixations or if there's comminution or associated posterior ileum fractures. And also, um, you want to have the low extremity intact in some of these situations because this would allow you full weight bearing. This is an example of um, um, a 45-year-old patient who actually, during a burglary, fell through a roof. His companion left and he had to wait until the police would pick him up. So he had this severe uh, acetabulum fracture on the right and then an unstable sacral fracture on the other side. So. Um, he could not fully weight bear on the right side, but being in jail, you know, he would probably not really stay in the wheelchair. And therefore, with the lumbopelvic fixation here on that side, he was able to fully weight bear on that side. Now, this is that 10 year old uh, girl with the high speed hunting rifle injury and the destruction of the posterior pelvis. There is hardly any fixation technique possible to stabilize that. However, the lumbopelvic fixation between the lower lumbar spine here and the fixation in the ilium was <coughs> stable, that stable that here you see the final uh, fusion of that complete area. In such a child, you cannot put all of these screws into the canal. Of course not, and you see it here. So these screws are in, out, in screws, and add the fixation. Um, so far, unilateral injuries. How about the two uh, bilateral injuries? And here the uh, spinopelvic dissociations with the complete obliteration of the sacral canal. So in these situations, you have to do a sacral laminectomy and a foraminotomy to decompress the nerves, which would even more destabilize the lumbopelvic junction. And in these fixations, you do here the lumbopelvic fixation on both sides. And then as a horizontal stabilization, you combine it, in this case, with SI screws. You cannot always put SI screws in, like in this um, impalement injury. If this is not possible, you do use crosslinks so that you compress actually the longitudinal bars to each other and thereby you have a solid fixation which allows also early mobilization of these patients. So we looked up 
um, here, 19 patients with these severe sacral uh, fracture dislocations um, with neurological impairment, with displacement. And uh, all of these patients um, had uh, um, a sacral, neural sacral decompression and then a lumbopelvic fixation. In these patients, uh, despite early full weight bearing and mobilization, there was no loss of reduction. On the other hand, we had neural improvement in 80%. Um, these injuries are very severe, so there were soft tissue problems, um, soft tissue injuries, and these were related to uh, soft tissue problems as well. In this study, out of 19 patients, we had three patients um, uh, who had a, um, a local infection. However, uh, two of these three had morel lavalier lesions. Um, we saw in about one third of the patients longitudinal rod breakage. As you may realize on this film here, this is because this osteosynthesis is bridging intact SI joints. So you have cyclic loading on this osteosynthesis and they uh, at one point will result in breakage. This breakage of the longitudinal rod in that situation is not a sign for a pseudarthrosis but is a sign for an intact bridged SI joint. When the longitudinal rod breaks, it doesn't matter, you can take it out, um, but it's not displacing as you can see here. Well, so far the fractures, the regular high energy fractures. I wanna show you this example of a spinopelvic instability. Um, uh, a person, let's see whether the, the movie is unfortunately not running. This is a plasmocytoma in a 49 year old patient and he has this destroyed sacrum and the ileum fracture. And uh, the ileum fracture was bridged with the long screws, uh, with two screws on each side, and um, the lumbopelvic fixation went to L4 and L5. Thereby, the whole posterior pelvis was stabilized, and the patient could immediately full be mobilized and uh, running. It might be that we have to run and start it again, but I think it, it doesn't matter. And this is the guy one year postoperatively under hemato-oncologic therapy, so fully weight-bearing and doing fine. The other indication are displaced sacral insufficiency fractures, as I mentioned, but there are other situations which we can deal with, like severe spondylodicitis with destruction at L4, L5, so you can do bridging osteosynthesis with a good anchorage in the ileum, you can take care of paraplegic patients with chronic infection and pseudarthrosis, as I have shown you before. Um, and uh, another example here with a severe pseudarthrosis at the L5 is one junction in a paraplegic patient just treated with a posterior fixation. There was a fusion here in front, therefore this was not connected. This was a, a surgery beforehand. Um, there was just a decortication of the dorsal elements done, but um, this in, is our experience in the paraplegic patients heals without even taking care of an anterior, uh, additional anterior fixation. Well, let me come to the end. The do's and don'ts for lumbopelvic fixation. Take a median approach. Um, depending, of course, on the soft tissue, but even in unilateral injuries, the median approach is much better because you might get soft tissue problems over the prominent screw at the PSIS. So therefore, we would recommend that. In unilateral fixations, the lumbopelvic fixation is not a distraction osteosynthesis because this may result in a scoliosis. You may uh, especially if the uh, facet joint at L5, S1 is injured, you may over-distract that joint. So do not over-distract that joint. Um, you always need a three-point fixation and you should definitely recess the ileum screws. I can warn you to use polyaxial screws, especially in the highly unstable situations like in a sacrectomy for tumors and so on, because my experience is that this is the weak point, the interconnection between the longitudinal rod and the polyaxial head. Do not use shank screws. They are too thin 
And also do not use tapered screws because they do not have a very good bite in the anterior part of these bony canals. And the screws should be at least nine centimeters and have a thickness of seven to eight millimeters. Well, what's still under discussion? The question first is, do you need one versus two iliac screws? Do you need long and short iliac screws? And do you need a segment augmentation? There is not lots of uh, literature out there. There are a couple of Chinese studies uh, in the Chinese and in the English literature. Um, um, what they recommend is two iliac screws if there is a highly unstable situation, osteoporotic bone, and then this would have a better bite. Well, this is not surprising. Uh, segment augmentation helps for the pullout strength, but um, they tested it only with a seven centimeter iliac screws, so I would recommend rather longer screws, and then short versus long screws. In this one study, they are saying that <coughs> Um, there is uh, the pullout strength is significantly higher with the long screws, yes, but the overall stiffness, at least in this study, is not uh, is similar with long and short screws. But I think this depends also on the thickness of the screws. And with that, I conclude my talk and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.